Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Summer Cup. Uh, so far it's going pretty well, I've won the two games that I played. Unfortunately, I did have those two buys, uh, but even with that happening, um, it's been... Uh, I'll talk about the standings later on, and we can see uh, that there might be a chance I actually win this thing, but yeah, <laughs> uh, gotta play the games first. A bit about p my opponent this game, uh, I had no idea going into this. Um, they had basically seven games online that I could find, uh, and they were all weirdly uploaded, not on chess or chess.com, some weird database, and they were basically useless. Um, so I had no preparation going into this, but luckily I'm white, so I get to dictate the pace of this game, so opening and preparation isn't as important, at least I don't think, um, for white. Um, but yeah. So getting into it, I oh, <laughs> I play knight f3. Uh, this is just what I play. Uh, if you want to, there's some reasoning in this game in the move order that I do, as with every other opening that I've played so far in the series. And I'm deliberately um, choosing slight differences in the variation. So it, it looks like I'm not playing the same opening sometimes. Uh, but trust me, this does make sense. And if uh, at some point... Uh, I might make a video about this opening or opening theory, uh, just uh, if anyone's interested. Uh, but knight f3, uh, knight f6. I'm quite happy to see knight f6 because most of the time this means people play the King's Indian, and uh, the King's Indian is a very fun opening to play against. We'll have a dynamic game. If I lose, at least I'll have a good time, pretty much. Um, C4. Um, I did play d4 against uh, my opponent round two, but that's only because I knew for sure that he played the King's Indian and was more likely to do so if I played d4. Um, the reason for playing c4 is to prevent uh, any sort of sidelines that may be annoying and would prevent me from going from my ideal setup. So hence I have to play c4 first. He plays g6. Um, looks like we're on for a King's Indian, so yep, I'm happy at this point. Can have a dynamic game. D4, expecting bishop g7. He plays d5. Now, this is a common uh, mistake um, that I see when I play this online um, on Lee Chess. The, the issue with this move is that often when, if c4 has already been played, then if you play d, uh, d5, without protecting it with one of these pawns first, and it's only protected by the knight. Um, it just means I'm just going to take, because if a pawn was protecting here, for example, take this pawn would take back, then black still has central control. He is at least still fighting for the center. But by not defending it with a pawn first, I can take. The only other option from knight takes would be queen takes, but this is just tempo gaining, and I'm going to play this next move, and it's going to be a great position. Um, he played what was played in the game knight takes, uh, sort of leads to the same situation. In the, I've sort of given, I've given up on my opening, so I've not gone for the main lines that I would like normally be in Keto, play the Catalan sort of style, but here. Why would I go through all the hassle and sort of allow him to um, make slightly inaccurate moves? I should be punishing, I should be controlling the center. Um, and this is what I go for. Um, he plays knight b6. Um, you can also play knight f6, just psychologically people don't play this because I've just moved a piece that way. Why would I move it back? So most people move over here. Um, and I play knight c3. Just, again, basic princi chess principles controlling the center. Look how much control I have over the center compared to black. Again, like, the material's equal, but this is so much more pleasant to play for white, and it's so much easier, and all the ideas that are going to come from this opening, it's just going to be nicer for me to play, and it's it's much harder for me to make mistakes, whereas it's going to become quite difficult, as we'll see as the game progresses for him to make accurate moves and defend. Um, 
Lee Chess, what I did find interesting is that Lee Chess sort of calls this opening the Neo Grunfeld. So this is similar to the Grunfeld, but the difference is that when I take on d4, the knight takes back, the bishop is already on this diagonal, and that pressure is sort of the compensation for black uh, compared to the center that I'm about to get, but he's gone ahead. He's <laughs> been trigger happy and sort of activated this too soon. Um, so I'm going to I'm basically a tempo up uh, from my normal Grunfeld setup. Um, he develops the bishop, most logical move. Um, at this point, attacking Fianchetto structures, you there's a nice sort of setup that I like to go for, and it starts with bishop e3. Idea being queen goes behind the bishop, we trade the bishop. He then has these darts go. He then says this pawn's getting pushed. Again, these ideas are very natural and easy to come across, uh, whereas playing as black is going to be a bit more complicated. Um, he castles, fairly standard. Um, I develop my bishop, I want to remain flexible, because although I do have this idea of just pushing and therefore I'd want to castle queenside, I also just could castle kingside and have a more positional advantage. Uh, the bishop is quite nice here on e2. Um, could have gone to c4, uh, but it can't because of the knight, uh, which would have been nice to attack the king, but I can't in the situation. Um, on d3, it might get in the way, and this pawn might become an issue um, in the future. So, yeah, just bishop on e2 sounds great. Uh, he develops the bishop, attacking my knight. This position has actually sort of been reached by relatively good players. Not Carlson, Geary, um, Nakamura sort of levels, um, but quite high rated 2600 players. And the idea, I'm guessing, is that in any kingside attack that I'm going for, this knight is going to be an important piece. And although black is going to be giving up the bishop pair, he is sort of stopping my attack, and I'll have to play for more a positional advantage, which is still great for white, but it becomes much harder to see and it's not as straightforward. Uh, which is why earlier on there are ideas of playing h3 and just stopping this idea entirely. Uh, but what I played in the game is also completely fine. Um, so he goes to this. I now play h3, which is perhaps redundant because in this position he's either just going to take... I mean, he's going to take and then uh, h3 is just nothing moving. I sort of wasted a tempo when I could have gone to h4 on one move. Um, so this is something I need to think about in the future, about attacking bishops in this situation, because I'm not really pinned, and uh, yeah, just a waste of my end. Um, he sort of <laughs> um, makes my mistake not a mistake anymore, and he retreats the bishop. Um, yeah, this isn't an ideal move, he's blocking his pawn, he really can't control any of the centre, fighting for sort of principle, fundamental chess. There's also ideas that now that he can't really develop his knight to um, to c6, c6, yeah, c6 because of the fork, he also can't develop it to uh, d7 because um, if knight d7, oh, it's my uh, <laughs> if knight d7 um, e5, this bishop has no squares to go along, they're all sort of controlled by pawns and his bishop will be trapped. And this is something I saw in the game. Um, which seems obvious, um, and it was to me, um, but then for some reason I just completely forgot about this idea, because this does come up later, and annoyingly, because the position slightly changed, it didn't occur to me, and yeah, <laughs> uh, we'll see. So, um, here I have some ideas, uh, idea number one is just go straight for the attack right now. Idea number two is to castle and just improve. Idea number three is to play queen d2, go for this battery, and then also potentially castle king side, uh, queen side and just go for an attack. And to me, that seemed like the most straightforward and logical idea. It might not be the most uh, accurate, but it's still pretty good. And for a human to play, it's very easy for white and Again, hard for black to respond. So, queen d2. Uh, c6. 
uh, sort of preventing uh, e5 and giving the bishop uh, more protection. And this is sort of the difference why I thought the bishop was now safe, uh, which we'll come to see. So going with, through my idea, bishop h6 and uh, knight 8 d7. Now, in my mind, although I'd seen the tactic of the bishop being trapped, for some reason I thought it didn't work anymore because um, the bishop would have meant this pawn can take and the bishop can escape. Um, which, well, it's smaller a second because first I have to trade. Uh, it takes takes. I'm happy with this trade. Dark square weaknesses around the king. This is good. Uh, what I now miss is simple tactic winning a piece for a pawn. Um, I thought this is now protected, so I can't push the pawn. Um, at least there'll be trades and the bishop will escape. Um, the sort of add on that I missed and what was I had even more because of how much control I have in the centre is this still works because although the bishop can retreat by going forward um, I can now play g4 and the bishop has no squares everything is covered um, and the bishop is attacked and it is lost uh, alternatively you could give up your knight as well this is also a move you could play but yeah you're losing a piece for a pawn um, which is not great that I didn't see that. Um, and it even hangs for another move as well, but it just shows I clearly wasn't aware of it. So from this game, I need to take away that an idea might work in one position. doesn't mean that it stops working, and I need to check. Uh, clearly that was a motive, a tactical idea in the position. I need to make sure concretely and calculate it and evaluate where it still works. And in this case, it did. Uh, but I continue with my plan. I decide I want this game to end. I I want to go for a checkmate. Uh, I have more space. It's going to be much easier for my pieces to move from one side of the board to the other. Um, so if something does happen on the queen side when my king comes under attack, it'll be much easier for my pieces to move back and defend. Um, also, I feel I have the tempo, and uh, this is sort of my game to... To show my uh, positional advantage, uh, he plays h5, sort of trying to go for some queenside counterplay. We've castled off as the side, so he wants to attack my king. I respond in kind. Uh, h4, now we can see that my h3 move was just a waste of tempo, and I could be one more move up than I was before. Uh, he brings his knight in. I'm happy to trade this knight. Um, like I said earlier, this knight is the main attacker in any kingside attack coming to the g5 square. This bishop in this on this diagonal isn't as great of an attacker as if it would be on either of these two diagonals. It's sort of a holding piece, and I'm happy to give up this bishop um, just to make sure that my kingside attack is much easier. And it will also deflect his bishop away from the king side. So I'm happy with this trade. Um, and it means I also have a tempo to play h5. I was more worried in this position after h5. h4, h5, this now becomes easier. And I've got to play for g4. And I've got to maneuver and think about it a bit more. Whereas, yeah, this makes it a bit more clearer. I can play with tempo. Uh, he has to be really careful here. For example... Uh, taking would probably lead to just checkmate. Um, trying to think else, what else I was thinking for. Uh, but yeah, it, there is lots of checkmates and possibilities. Uh, he plays rook h8, which is fine. Um, now, I have a few choices here. Whether to keep the tension or go for the check right away. The reason why I wouldn't want to go for the check is if my queen comes to d4 at some point if I push the pawn I could be attacking the bishop and the knight, uh, and the king sorry, and potentially the rook as well and this will either lead to significant material loss or just straight up checkmate because if you imagine the king on the back rank uh, he has no squares if the queen is attacking at the corner um, So, but I decide h6 go for the check now uh, because I forced the king back to the back rank he's sort of castled and now he's uncastled and the Rook is back where it started, and this diagonal idea still works because I'm thrusting a checkmate on g7 if his king's on the back rank and the bishop still hangs. 
Um, so I go for this idea. Uh, he plays king f8. Um, I now I feel I'm definitely much better in this position, uh, even material equal, and I want to start sort of exposing the fact that his rook is going to be stuck in this corner the rest of the game because the king can't maneuver to get him out. The only way the king can sort of sidestep is if this pawn was to push this pawn. And this is three or four moves just to get one piece back into the game. So I feel I need to go now. Uh, I start it off with d5, just sort of exploding the center and allowing all my pieces to come. This rook's going to come here, perhaps uh, this way too. Um... The knights are going to come into the center. It looks great. I'm happy with this. Uh, takes takes. And perhaps the most annoying move that he played this game, uh, rook c8. Now, this is the second lesson I need to learn from this game. Is sometimes it's okay to be a bit patient. Because as we'll see later on, the, the tactics still mostly work in my favor. But they would have been completely crushing if this knight, if this open file wasn't an issue and my king was on b1 rather than c1 because my knight coming to d5 or e4 in certain situations is just game winning. Imagine it's on this square, uh, as we'll see later on. Be very good. So there's definitely time in this position for prophylaxis and just moving the king out of this uh, potentially annoying uh, pin. It's not that um, he's threatening something, it's more it's slowing down my attack. Um, instead I tried to be active in this position. Definitely, um, as we'll see later on, King B1 was the right idea, but it seems so weird to play when you're this far ahead, sort of just King safety. But it is not about King safety, it's about allowing this knight to be an aggressive piece. Uh, but d6. Uh, I had to think quite hard about d6 because there's quite a few options for him to play. Uh, after d6, he could play um, e6. Um, he could play um, knight f6. He could play knight b6. But really, he has to get rid of this tension on the pawn. Uh, which is why I thought e6 was probably the best move. The computer says e5 is slightly better, but I didn't even consider that in the game. Um, but my idea, again, why, and I should have known this, and why I should have played king b1, is that if he plays e6, then this knight will come to here and then to here, once supported by the queen. Or even to this outpost with the pawn protecting it. And this is completely dominating. Um, and again, why? King B1 is a great move. Um, but this doesn't come to a head. And this position is very winning. If you look at it with a computer, this position is still winning. But again, King B1. Uh, he moves the knight. I took about half an hour in this position. Um, and it was very hot. It was 30 degrees, I was chugging water like crazy, <laughs> I was sweating. It's very hot in the UK at the moment. And um, I really had to think about this move, because there are quite a few options. Um, so, my pieces are on mostly ideal squares. But my rook would rather be on e1, my queen would rather be on d4. Still controlling this file, but also now controlling the diagonal. Um, so I did have ideas of pushing, and then when the rook defends, playing rook, uh, queen d4. This does work, but not for the reasons that I thought it would, because what I was playing in the game was, although I'm giving up this pawn, because uh, he has three attackers, I only have two defenders. He can only take with the queen, because if the if the knight takes, I take the rook with checkmate. If the rook takes, I can just take his bishop, so therefore the queen is the only one that can take. I would then take with my queen, and then he takes with his rook. I take my rook in, he takes with the knight, I take with the rook. Um, he can move back, and either this, or I was calculating g4, g5. 
and I thought that this was great because um, either he's going to be stuck in the corner or uh, when I play g4 he would have to um, play e6 to avoid uh, this coming with checkmate when I kick the knight because the knight could no longer defend on h8 um, e8 or be lost and the king would have to come have to need to have a luff square on e7 but that would mean the rook would fall um but this is all flawed thinking <laughs> as much as as nice as this variation would have been because when i take with the rook back here uh sorry when i take the queen back here he doesn't have to take the rook you can just take with the knight and annoyingly this position starts becoming much more equal the king's now going to be getting out the rook is no longer stuck in uh, the pits of hell <laughs> and can come back to life and yeah so I, i'm i'm glad that i didn't go for this variation but it's my fault for not calculating all the lines that my opponent can play i i need to be able to come up with the best moves for my opponent as well as myself so uh go back to the game itself uh, this is all sidelines. Okay, here we go. So, I was thinking about that, but because I wasn't able to concretely show that this knight, this uh, rook that goes eventually to uh, d8 idea works, because I was thinking maybe the knight blocks, I decided not to go for it, because I didn't have the exact line down, and if I'm going into a position where I'm giving up a pawn, I really do need to make sure that I have... Uh, the compensation for it. So I decided not to go for it. And um, I was right, but for the wrong reasons. So instead I take. And this is the second idea that I was thinking about for ages. Um, because, again, my knight is pinned, so it can't come into these tactics. And it would be really nice if it would. Because let's explore. So pawn takes, queen takes. Uh, my idea was rookie one just bringing it to this file, just controlling the file. This looks great. Uh, then bishop um, e5 would have been annoying. I think probably the best try. Um, which um, opens up this pin prop for, for real rather than the bishop being in the way. And then my knight can't come into the game. It's very cramped for black and this is still definitely better for white but it is much harder to see uh, the plan forward probably the knight going to g5 or this queen activating in some way be the way forward uh, but it's still not as clear uh, but this isn't the line that I was most scared of the line that I was most scared of and what actually happened in the game is pawn takes king takes now the idea here being rookie one, as with the queen idea, um, bishop comes back to e6. Still, again, better for white, but the king has finally escaped from this back rank. This rook is getting back into the game. There's tensions against the queen. The king is safe. I can't unleash a pin against the bishop because this uh, I'm pinned to myself. And um, yeah, it wasn't ideal. But the second he played this, I got annoyed with myself because for the last half an hour I've been really stressing about this position and thinking this was the best move for him and the instant he played it there's a winning move for white on the spot technically two but the same idea so pause the video if you want just see if you can see the tactic um, yeah so I had spent so long thinking about rookie one in all of these lines but in this case rookie one is not the idea um, because it'll just block with the bishop, but instead uh, checking with the queen. So either queen e3 or queen e1, which seems sort of counterintuitive to when we're in the position back here, but now it of course makes sense because as soon as I check him, this rook now sees the queen, the queen can't block the check, the queen is going to be lost for the rook, and it's just a clean uh, exchange for white. And he, I mean, he can block as he did before, but then, um, yeah, this is sort of the position that would come for it. I could either then even go for trades and just make my life easier. Um, but yeah, 
uh, after I played this move, he sort of sighed and he um, thought about it for a few minutes and then resigned. Um, he didn't want to carry on playing, uh, which is fair enough. Um, but yeah, so this was the game. Um, I was very much seeing ghosts for um, for about 30 minutes, not realising that there's a simple winning tactic. And um, he also missed it too, clearly. And it was only until it was staring me right in the face that I was able to see. Um, just show, I, I, I'll blame the weather for this one. Um, but that means I'm 3 out of 3. And I was also sitting next to board 1. I was on board 2. And... Um, Basically, there are six people before this round that were fighting for first. Um, one of them has a buy in a later round, so it's unlikely that they would get to first. Uh, the person that they were facing um, was also on nine points. We're all on nine points. Um, but he didn't show up so that day, so he also got a buy. So basic basically, the two people sitting to my right um, were out, are out of the race. As long as uh, everyone wins their games, that is. Then to the person I'm playing against is also 9 points and tied with me. I've now beaten him, so I will win any head-to-heads. And I'm also now just uh, on 12 points and he's now on 10, so I've got 2 point lead. And on board 1, um, there's one more 9 point player and a girl that's on 12 points and currently was in the lead. Now, I calculated beforehand, if I beat her when I get to play her, then I will be drawing with her, and maybe I win the head-to-head because I actually beat her. But then it gets a bit messy. But the other nine-point player actually beat her. So now there's effectively um, four of us on 12 points. Uh, but one of those is one of the people that had... Um, the buy uh, to the right of me, so he's not going to be a contender with only two rounds left. And both my last game, I haven't yet played uh, the two people on board one and two. So if I am to beat those two players, um, then if I win my next two games, I am 100% first place, and there's nobody that could catch up to me or contest me. So that would be exciting. I could win £100 and pay back for my uh, emission fee, which would be nice. Um, it'd also just be nice to win. Um, so yeah, I need to make sure that I'm prepped for those two games, and I need to make sure that uh, I bring my A game, because this is now, in spite of me having those two unfortunate buyers, uh, it's all on me to make sure that uh, I can do this. I'm not sort of hoping that somebody beats somebody else in the uh, yeah, this is, uh, I'm the control of my destiny. Um, but yeah, I look forward to week six and seven. And yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, bye. <laughs>